everyone. Well, thanks for coming to our first uh, Origin of Life IAP seminar this year. Uh, today we have uh, Lauren Williams from uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, so Lauren is a biochemist that studies the origin of life, especially from the perspective of the origins of the ribosome translation and how that intersects with some of the earliest polymers and biomolecules that would have arisen in prebiotic systems on Earth and some of the uh, earliest uh, complex macromolecular systems uh, that we might think of as being alive. Uh, so we'll just uh, jump in with uh, Lauren's talk, and then afterward um, we will have a Q&A session uh, with the audience for as long as people are happy to stick around. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you guys for coming out and hearing me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to sort of be talking about the origin of life, but I have a sort of an unusual take on the origin of life, which is that I don't have any model that I, um, that I am advancing or that I even like. I'm basically, we just, I'm just obsessed by the ribosome. And we're just, we just try to read the history of the ribosome uh, as far back as we can, trying to understand the evolutionary origins of the ribosome. And it turns out, I didn't know this in the beginning, but that, as far as I can see, is the origins of the ribosome and the origins of life are sort of the same thing. So that's kind of how I came to be working on the origins of life really just trying to understand uh, the evolution of the ribosome. So I really don't know who my audience is quite, but I thought I would give a little bit of introduction to uh, what the translation system is. The translation system is this really special thing in biology. Um, the way to think about it, it is the transduction of information between two polymers that are in different chemical spaces. So you have mRNA down here, and you have protein coming out here. And the, of course, the sequence of the mRNA uh, dictates the sequence of the protein. And the reason why, one of the reasons why translation is sort of special is because it's, the information is going between polymers that are chemically distinct. If you think about uh, you know, replication and transcription, you know, there's a famous uh, line in Watson and Crick's paper where it says something like, it has not escaped our notice. You guys probably know this that the mechanism of replication is immediately obvious from the structure we propose. Right? So as soon as they saw the structure of DNA, they could say, yeah, we can kind of understand how this molecule could replicate. But translation is totally different. right? You can look at the structure of RNA and the structure of protein and try to understand the, how information passes between those. And it's, not, it's like not at all obvious. Even now, it's, the more we know about the ribosome, kind of the less obvious it is. We have these two really distinct polymers. They're in different chemical spaces, right? They have nothing to do with each other chemically. One is polyanionic, one is neutral, one assembles by its backbone, one assembles by its side chains. These are in totally different chemical spaces, and yet we can transduce information between them. So this is a special part of biology. This is, I believe, biology's crowning achievement. Is the, I'm obsessed by the ribosome, by the way. So, but the ribosome is, is how you get information between two polymers that, that have nothing to do with each other chemically. It's a very special thing in biology. So we have the small subunit. It's nice because uh, things are kind of separated for us. We have the small subunit, which is where decoding takes place. And we have the large subunit, which is where the chemical reaction takes place. That's called the peptidyl transferase reaction. Um, just some players. We have tRNAs that are charged. That means you have an amino acid on a tRNA, that, and you have 20 synthetases that actually do that charging. This is where the uh, genetic code is kind of maintained and enforced by these 20 uh, synthetases that put the right amino acid on the right tRNA. That's, that's the genetic code, uh, that relationship. Um, these subunits, when, when we're not doing translation, they can live separately. They're happy, independent of each other. They're stable. They don't associate really until, until it's time to actually do the, do the work, make the, make the molecule. I want to, uh, this is of course a cartoon I got from the web someplace. Uh, I want to talk about this part right here. This is a, a special place. This is the tunnel. This doesn't really show up very well. This is called the exit tunnel. Um, the exit tunnel is, it's like, I look at sort of like the birth canal of protein, right? It's this sort of special place that protects protein and, and keeps it from being functional, and it just it kind of slowly delivers it into the world. This is a really, this is, in fact, 
The evolution of the tunnel is, is so important to the ribosome, and the function of the tunnel is so important to the ribosome. And in fact, we didn't really, until we really could understand the evolution of the ribosome, we didn't really get how important the tunnel was. But the tunnel is central. When I, in fact, when you think about the evolution of the large subunit, you should really think about the evolution of the tunnel. The evolution of the, of the, of the large subunit is really all about the tunnel. And I'll show you that in a while. OK, so. No, it's a tunnel. We've sliced through here. It's a tunnel. In fact, this tunnel was discovered by Alex Rich here at MIT originally. It's a tunnel. This is, this is a slice through. No, it's, it's a tunnel. It's a long tunnel. OK, so this is one of the peculiar things about the ribosome, about the translation system, that when we talk about sort of universal biology, things that are universal to you and to to bacteria and to archaea, uh, those things are essentially the translation system. These are, this is called what I call the universal gene set of life. These are the genes that are observed in everything alive. And um, I've color coded them, it's kind of faint here, but the ones that are related to translation are pink. And the ones that are related, related to transcription are blue, replication, there, I don't see any replication. And there's, there's this little outlier. I don't know what that's about. And this is not the full list, because this is none of the genes that encode for RNAs. So the genes that encode for tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs are not there. If they, if they were on this list, there would be a lot more pink. Okay, so the point of this is that the universal genes in biology, or the universal gene set of biology, is essentially the translation system. And this is a problem in the origin of life, because when we think about the origin of life, at least many people, they think about replication, right? Biology is all about replication. And we would really like it if these were all genes to do with replication, because then that would make sense that the universal gene set of life would tell us about the origin of life. I think it still is, but I think it's not telling us what we want to hear. And um, so the origin of life is really about the origin of translation. That's what I'm saying. And uh, it's the standard models are, you know, if you think about RNA world, and et cetera, it's all about replication. But I think the ribosome is telling us we need to think about things a little differently. So these, everything alive has these genes, these, pink, these genes. Okay? Everything alive has a ribosome. In fact, the definition of biology to me is something that translates. If you do translation, you're alive, like viruses are not alive until they get control of a cell, and then they can do translation, and then they're alive. Okay, so anything with a ribosome is alive. Anything without a ribosome is not alive. That sounds kind of like a trivial statement, but really what it means is that, to me, biology is defined as the transduction of information between dissimilar polymers. That's my definition of life. That's what I think NASA, if they want to look for life on Mars, that's what they need to look for. Because that's, that's the special, universal part about biology on Earth. OK, so this is, uh, this is the Banfield, the recent uh, Tree of Life, which I have kind of distorted and bent. But this is, this is everything alive pretty much is represented here. And you can see that life is mostly bacterial, that there's some archaea. And then eukarya is really, we're a branch of archaea. That seems to be, I don't know if Greg agrees with this Tree of Life. There's a lot of different trees of life, but this is, I like this tree of life. I like this version because it really shows you how bacterial the biosphere is. If when, we, when we think about biology, we always think about us, eukaryotes, and we're so interesting. But really, the genetic diversity of biology is, is all out here in bacteria. OK, so but the, thing that, the, the reason this is a tree of life is that everything translates. In fact, what this is is this is the distance relationships between translation systems. Right? That's what this tree amounts to. In fact, you couldn't make a tree from anything else because nothing else is universal. If you tried to make a tree of life from membrane biosynthesis, you couldn't do it because there's no universal membrane biosynthesis. There's no way everything could be on the same tree. The only way you can make a tree of life is using translation. In fact, if you look at Carl Woese and how he, how he discovered the third branch, you know, the archaeal branch of the tree of life, it was because he used the translation system to do it. He used ribosomal RNA sequences, and he could make a universal tree of life. If he had used anything else besides translation, we never would have heard of him. Maybe he would have done something else. I don't know. But he certainly would not have discovered archaea. Okay? He could only do that because somehow he was wise enough to know that translation was the universal biology. 
And I've read his letters. He actually wrote some letters to Francis Crick about he deliberately chose translation. And he said, translation has got to be the oldest part of biology. It's got to be the core of biology. So I'm going to use the translation system to answer the deepest, oldest questions in biology. So this, to me, is one of, he's one of the smartest, uh, sort of most profound thinkers uh, in, in recent science history, I think, Carl Wolves. OK, so we have, we're trying to understand the origins of the ribosome. And what we, need, we need to go beyond this universal gene thing. And what we've done is, we've, with a lot of labor, we've gone into the, all the ribosomal genes and structures and everything and said, what is universal about the ribosome itself? OK, so that's what this is. These red parts, this is the bacterial ribosome. This is an archaeal ribosome. This is a eukaryotic ribosome. And the colored parts are the universal thing. They're the thing that everything has. So for example, if you look at this helix right there, or let's look at that helix right there. It's there, and it's there. So it's blue, right? Everything alive has that helix. Okay, if we look at most of the, okay, if we look at this, that thing right here, see it's, it's different down here, right? So uh, this is actually, this is, this is something we're gonna talk about here. See that black there? That's because this helix is different in archaea, and then it becomes really gigantic in eukarya. Okay? So, that's, so the black parts are the part that are non-universal. So the main point of this is, this is just looking at the E. coli version of this, is, and the blue parts are the universal part. So the, the point I want you to take away this is to a first approximation, the bacterial ribosome is universal to everything alive. What it means is you and the microbes in your gut and everything alive has these blue parts, OK? These colored parts are what are different. So another way to say that is you have bacterial ribosomes inside of you, OK? Everything alive has a bacterial ribosome. But not exactly, because there are expansions. In fact, these colored regions here, these gray regions, excuse me, are where the eukaryotic ribosome has sort of sent out Various things. So, yes. So, if you compare Hi. just bacteria and archaea, mm -hmm. is it blue all over? No. Where does it differ? Well, I mean, this is eukaryotes. No, look at so, for example, helix uh, twenty-five here. See how big it is. No, in I'm about the small. Oh, it's small. Okay. Uh, see that? So, there's differences. There's different small. In, this is a small sub, the small subunit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. See that? See, uh, that's larger in, in uh, bacteria than in archaea. So there are differences. One of the things you can see in archaea is, in general, you can sort of anticipate uh, eukarya. A lot of the places where there is divergence here, like this is an archaeal. It gets this is larger than in bacteria, and then it's like way larger in archaea. So there's a lot of places where you can see that that archaea is on the road to eukarya as far as the expansions. The expansions aren't there, but you can see it's kind of bubbling away. It's about ready to explode into sort of this eukaryotic expansion. You can see that, that in archaea. OK, so this is, the back, this, is, this is basically the point I want to make here is that the, the bacterial ribosome is universal it's pretty much to everything alive. Basically, the blue parts here are universal. Um, but let's, now let's go into three dimensions and look at that. So now we're looking at the backbone trace of part of the bacterial ribosome. And uh, we're ignoring sequence. In fact, in my lab, we're really structural. We, we look at phylogeny by sequence. We don't really look too much at, well, we use, sorry, we use structure. We really don't focus on sequence uh, too much. So this is the bacterial, uh, part of the bacterial ribosome. This is part of the archaean ribosome. This is part of the eukaryotic ribosome. And you can see how similar these things are, right? The atoms basically have not moved. And then to go into sort of the lunatic fringe of evolution where things happen in crazy ways, we can look at mitochondria. This is a human mitochondrial RNA. And so this is basically 4 billion years of evolution for nothing, right? Over 4 billion years. Nothing has happened. In fact, we one time, I took RMSDs of these atoms and converted it to miles per hour because we have 4 billion years and we have like 
about a quarter of an angstrom of RMSD, and you can convert that to miles of hour. That's how fast the ribosome is changing. It was very slow. I don't remember what the number was, but it was a very small number. Okay, so one of the ways to say is you can, uh, I, I predict that in two billion years, nothing is going to happen, okay? Some people say you can't predict what's gonna happen in biology. I can predict confidently. In fact, I'm gonna write this in cement and blast it into outer space and say the ribosome is not gonna change in two billion years. That's my prediction. I will bet money on that. Okay, but that's just the core. On the external ribosome, this is really what's happening. So this is this common core. I'm just showing you the large subunit. I'm focusing on the large subunit here. And this is the part that's universal to everything. But then eukaryotes have a, another shell around the outside of that. That's called the eukaryotic shell. And then metazoans, especially it's very strange. I'm not sure what this is, but there's, we're now in what we call the octopus phase, where the ribosome has sent out these tentacles that um, are really long. I mean, in, immensely long. I think this is the longest double helical RNA in all of biology, I would bet. I don't really know that, but I've been saying that, and nobody's contradicted me. So if anybody knows a longer one, these are hundreds of angstroms long of double helical RNA that shoot out, and they're not integrated with the ribosome. Okay, They're out there hanging in space. And this, we're trying to. We're, I mean, we're doing a lot of work in our lab. We're doing pull-down experiments, trying to figure out what proteins these bind to, trying to understand these things. We don't fully understand. But it, it has to do with warm blood, you know, chickens, humans, uh, you know, metazoans uh, have these tentacles. They're really interesting, and, and nobody knows what they do. Actually, so this is a human ribosome, and I'm showing you. These are these tentacles. And so, the, they're hard to see, like this is a cryo-EM structure of Beckman, I think, and uh, so this part that comes out, we don't, we're only seeing like this part of it. This is the B helix, so this thing shoots way out. You can see on the scale of the ribosome, this thing goes way, way out here. Okay, so these are enormous tentacles, and if you imagine polyribosomes, you know, where we have these big arms of RNA waving out in space. We think these are docking sites for proteins, you know, that have to do with protein quality control and uh, maybe degradation of uh, misfolded proteins, et cetera. So that's what we think these are about. Okay, so actually, so this, this is just that, I wanna focus what we call expansion segment seven. That's this purple part right here. And we've done a lot of work with expansion segment seven, and here we have mapped it onto the eukaryotic phylogenetic tree. So you can see things like, uh, these are like, um, you know, Giardia uh, pathogens that are kind of dependent on their host. They really, they look almost like bacteria there. But uh, then you get into yeast, it gets bigger. And then this is the tentacle phase right here, starting with warm, this is right here, chickens, mouse, chimpanzees, and humans. I made this before the election. I guess I need a new, that was my campaigning. I failed. Um, anyway, you see these uh, long, and this is, I find this really interesting. Humans have these long tentacles here. Chicken, the tentacle is in a different place, but it still has, has, uh, has tentacles. So there's something about warm blood. We think maybe, maybe complicated brains or something, because uh, it could have to do with, uh, with protein misfolding and you know, the sensitivity of neurons to misfolding, that these, that these tentacles are, because ha we have, when our pull-down experiments, we have seen the proteasome and other sorts of things involved in protein quality control associated with these things. So it's really interesting to think. The protein makes ribosomes. I mean, it makes protein. The, the ribosome makes protein. And it, it has these arms that are holding the proteasome, and it degrades it at the same time. So in fact, it's known that protein comes right out of the ribosome, goes right into the proteasome, and gets degraded. It's made and degraded at the same time. Okay? That's how dangerous misfolded proteins are. It's very inefficient but it's very necessary. So we think all of these arms have to do with the sensitivity of metazoans, like us, to misfolded proteins. Bacteria, you know, you can misfold proteins in bacteria, they don't care, but for us it's very dangerous. Okay, so now let's, let we, this is a nice thing that has just happened recently, is we can make movies of the ribosome growing in three dimensions. And the reason we can do that is because we now have so many structures of ribosomes and we know their relationship on the phylogenetic tree. And so we can basically watch the ribosome grow 
in three dimensions. And I'll show, and it's, this, is, this is unbelievable. I've shown this in many talks, and I still get excited every time I show it. So look at, look at what this looks like. This, this bacterial, um, this is just this, this one helix, 20, helix 25. And this is the bacterial, this, this part of the ribosome, this is our best approximation of LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. Okay, so this is the oldest part of the ribosome. And when it gets bigger, this is how it grows, okay? So this is, this is what I want you to see. This, this base helix stays here and something grows out of it, okay? So this is like a tree growing, right? Where you, you just grow a branch out, but the other branch doesn't die and go away. So this is an archaean. Then we know that eukarya came out of archaea. So this is, so look at, basically this, this helix is still here. And, uh, and, and essentially the whole archaean RNA is there, we actually that bent a little bit, but the yeast has grown bigger things. It has sent branches out. And then this is a fruit fly. Um, so the common ancestor of fruit fly and yeast is closer to yeast. So now we, the thing is you can still see that the, the fruit fly has its ancestral RNA, but it has grown additional branches out. And now if we look at the next step, here's the human ribosome and you can see now our best, our best estimate for the ancestor of human and fruit fly is, is, is closer to fruit fly. So you can see that the human has, sent, has, has basically has maintained its ancestral state and sent out, um, ten, has sent out uh, appendages. So look, this is what I want you to think about here. This is like a time-lapse movie of a tree growing, right? It just, it just adds on and, it does, and when it grows new things, it does, not, it does not remodel the underlying structure, okay? So it's like a tree growing. You know, if you, if you think about a tree accumulating rings, right? You don't remodel the previous rings. You just put rings on, and, and uh, that's called accretion, okay? So the ribosome grows by accretion, just like a tree grows by accretion. And this is a beautiful thing for us, because just like a tree records its own history, Right? You, can, you can look at the weather 30 years ago or whatever by a tree because the tree has recorded its history. The ribosome has recorded its history also. Okay? This helix 25 never, ever goes away. It is in every ribosome, and that will never go away. So the history of macromolecular structure at that point is fixed, and we never lose that history. Okay, so this is an, uh, I won't go over this in detail, but this is just, this is, you know, it doesn't, we see many of these examples. Of, of this kind of thing. Okay, so we can, we can see that the ribosome grows by accretion. Okay, so there's, there's a couple points here I want to make to this. Um, firstly, is that the ribosome, even though I told you everything alive has the same translation system, but actually on its periphery, it's changing, right? So you have a bacterial ribosome inside of you, but you have a lot of stuff on the outside. You have that, what we call the protist shell, the eukaryotic shell, and then you have these uh, tentacles coming out. So you have the bacterial ribosome, but then you have these appendages on it. And uh, this is sort of a thing we've done. This is, I don't know what the significance is, but we have made a graph of the largest ribosome on the planet versus time. And uh, so I don't know really when the origin of life was, something around, four billion years ago, but we presume there were no ribosomes at that point. Um, if anybody knows different, I'm open to that. But then uh, pretty soon we have fossils, so we know that the bacterial ribosome was basically done quite quickly, uh, the, our, the prokaryotic ribosome, and then, it's, and then nothing happened. For several billion years, nothing happened. And now we're in this log phase. There's something about mammals and warm blood, and we can predict out another couple billion years and the ribosome is gonna truly be gigantic. Okay, so we are in log phase of ribosomal growth right now. And actually, the, you could say the same thing for the spliceosome and for other parts of biology. This sort of uh, elaboration that is going on um, in the most complicated organisms is just a general phenomena that you see in the ribosome. But the size of the ribosome is a very good proxy for complexity. If you want to know how complicated an organism, just look at the size of its ribosomal RNA, and that basically, you can scale things like that. Things with big ribosomal RNAs are complicated. Yes? So why you would you expect that this whole subunit doesn't really change that much? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. It doesn't expand. So. Yes, you know what it does? If I scale this up 10 times, it looks the same. So it is doing it, but very small. Yes, and I'll tell you why. Because, I think, <laughs> the, the small subunit never sees protein. 
Right? This is all about protein and interactions with protein and delivery of proteins to various organelles and all sorts of stuff like that, right? The small subunit is not involved in that, right? So, um, yes? What happens if you scale this ribosome by the total number of proteins that the organism has? The total number? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know that. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know. What do you think? Do we make more proteins than yeast? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Part, yeah, the size, but the size of the genome doesn't work. You know, a lungfish has a genome a hundred times the size of us, right? And so, basically, in fact, there's something that used to be called the c-value dilemma, which is that complexity, organism, organismal complexity, does not correlate with genome size. That's for sure. Yes. One other thing: the way the large subunit has grown as you have shown so beautifully, is like it's onion-like. It's growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's onion-like. Whereas the small subunit is not doing that. It's not growing onion-like. When you go back to the origin and evolution of the small subunit, it's growing quite differently exactly. than the large subunit. So you're not getting that sort of onion-like growth and the explosion on the periphery. That's right. You know, uh, one of the ways uh, to think about the, the uh, large subunit is sort of this monolithic hemisphere that's growing and growing, and the small subunit is like a dendrite, okay, with, with these sort of flexible things. These, the small subunit and the large subunit have different evolutionary origins, they have different structures, and they really, they are very different. For a long time, we really were stumped to figure out why the large and small subunit were so different, um, but I, I think I can tell you why. I think we have an idea for it. Yes. So one of the other processes that happens in many lineages is uh, reduction of genomes or simplification, especially in parasites or in, mm -hmm. in specialist microbes. Do these also shrink their ribosomes? Yeah, yeah. I showed you Giardia. Um, the, yes, there's some small ribosomes. And in, in organelles, uh, the, the ribosomal RNA has shrunk. The ribosomal proteins have gotten increased in quantity. And in plants, uh, the chloroplast ribosomes are like, some of them are gigantic. You know, all kinds of crazy things go on in chloroplasts. So, yeah, this is cytoplasmic uh, ribosomes here. Okay. All right, so this was all introduction to what I really want to talk about, which is the origins of the ribosome. So let's talk about that for a minute. So this is one of the things we saw a while ago that um, sort of opened a big, big door to us that when the ribosome expands, and we know a lot about ribosomal expansions because we have all these structures of eukaryotic ribosomes. So that we know the structures of ribosomes of various sizes, and we know them in a lot of detail, and there's a lot of them now. It's really good. So when ribosome expands, it does this thing. So I, I'm going to show you. This blue thing is a prokaryotic ribosome, part of the prokaryotic ribosome. And the red is part of a eukaryotic ribosome, except I've colored this part. This is also eukaryotic. And what you can see here, this is when I, what I mean by accretion, is the eukaryotic part has expanded out of the prokaryotic part, right? So this is a recent growth on the ribosome. And uh, it turns out that there is a very distinct structural fingerprint when that happens. And so we looked at a lot of these. These are called expansion segments. We looked at a lot of these expansion segments. Here are some of them. You see, uh, this is the old, the blue is the old, and then the red and the green are the new. And here's, so this is helix 38, this is helix 24. And, uh, and so there is a very distinct structural fingerprint when the ribosome grows. Okay, we call this an insertion fingerprint. I won't go into the structural details, but you can see, you can recognize this. So basically, you have a nice helix, and you grow another helix out without perturbing this one. I mean. Uh, really, look at the nucleotides here are essentially in the same place. You can grow one of the amazing things about RNA, which we think is like a, a critical structural sort of element of RNA, is that you can insert things out of it and you can, you can do these elaborations without changing the underlying structure. And protein, you can't really do this. You know, when you, when you add something to protein, it really perturbs the backbone structure because it's so much more constrained. Okay, RNA structure, the backbone, has a lot of degrees of freedom. And so it allows you to do these insertions without messing up the underlying structure. OK, so the, this, is, this is what we call an insertion fingerprint that we see in the ribosome. So we know this, OK? We, this is like, this is a, 
I don't know what it is. It's a, it's, it's a eukaryotic. This is eukaryotic, and this is some prokaryotic. And this is another one. Now, this is different. This is a place where we looked in the ribosome, in the, in the universal part of the ribosome, and we faked it. We cut this off, and we resealed it with a computer. Okay, so we have, here we have walked back, in, walked back in time, and we have tried to simulate what this process looked like in the universal part of the ribosome. Okay? So the idea is that by seeing these fingerprints in the parts of the ribosome we know has grown, we can look in the ancient, universally conserved part of the ribosome, and we can figure out how that grew. Okay, does that make sense? And just for example, this is tRNA. And Paul Schimmel, when he was here, I actually did this experiment for us where he, he didn't think about it in this context, but he actually cut this off and made this red part of RNA. And it charged, you know, this is, this is Paul's uh, mini helix. So we see the same kind of insertion fingerprints in tRNA. So we can use these insertion fingerprints to figure out how RNA grows, even if we don't have a series of structures, right? Once we recognize the fingerprint, then we can look at any RNA and we can say, oh, this is where a, a growth event took place. Does that make sense? So these are, these are two observed ones. This is an inferred one. This is an observed one. But we don't have the ancestor of tRNA, except the one that Paul made. OK, so this is basically, this is the part you can decide whether you want to believe me or not. But we, so we observe that the modern ribosome grew and is growing by this accretion process. OK, that's an observation. And we observe that the modern ribosome, some of these growth events left these very distinct observable fingerprints. Okay, so these are things we know to be true. Then we make these two assumptions. We assume that the common core, the universal part, also grew by accretion. And we assume that it also has these fingerprints. Okay, so this, this we don't know because all the universal part is the same in everything. So we don't know this. We're just assuming this. Okay, so if you don't want to believe these assumptions are credible, then that's fine. But th this is our working model. So then based on that, we can look in the common core, and we can figure out how it grew. So it's really, it's like, this is, a, I think, a really good analogy. You've seen trees grow, so you know how they grow. So if I gave you some yellow sticky tabs, and I said, I want you to give me the yellow dates of everything on this tree. I want you to give me the, the relative dates of everything on this tree. You could do it, right? The leaves are the most recent, the bran big branches are, because the tree grows by accretion. If this tree died every year and then grew back, then it wouldn't work, right? But since a tree, it, it records its history, it maintains its history, it keeps adding and adding. And so you can go in, like right there, that's the oldest part, right in the center, right? So the ribosome for us is just like this tree. We can look at the universal part of the ribosome and we can date everything in the ribosome. Because just like you're familiar with how a tree grows, we know how the ribosome grows. So what this means is that the molecular record of the origin of life, and I call the origin of the ribosome is the origin of life, is maintained in the, in the translation system because these fingerprints of growth are recorded for us in the ribosome. I believe that says the same thing in Spanish. I gave a talk in Mexico and they translated, but I really don't know that. Okay. So now we're looking at the common core. This is the part of the ribosome that is universal to everything alive. And every place the color changes, we see one of those insertion fingerprints. Okay? So there's a lot of them. And, uh, and the secondary structure is not a very good representation of three-dimensional structure. So it might not make sense here. But uh, so what we know is this green is older than that red, which is older than that green. Which is, we, know, we know the dates. And we know the specific events by which the ribosome grew. We don't know all of them, because we also know that sometimes helices elongate. And when that happens, there's no fingerprint left. So we're not seeing everything. We're seeing some things. We know that a lot of growth events took place that we, we don't see, but uh, we see a lot of them. In fact, we see enough. In fact, we see more than we want to, because we don't really know what to do with all of this. Uh, there's 56 uh, in the large subunit, and I don't remember, 26 in the small subunit. And that's actually a lot. Did you have a question? Well, isn't it degradation after a while? Uh, only, no, only in very, in general, no. The, the general process of the ribosome is it grows. We don't, in, in some of these systems like uh, in organelles and in pathogens like Giardia, then we do. But in general, no. We, we don't see very much cutting back. So it just keeps going. Through. Keeps growing, yeah. 
That's, that's what we see. Um, but that has nothing to do with strength. Strength? Well, proteins, we, we equate proteins with strength, don't we? Uh, RNA. Yeah, but uh, no, I would say not strength. I, I say the sophisticated, the, the bigger, like the eukaryotic ribosomes can produce more sophisticated proteins. That, um, that are more problematic as far as misfolding. And you know, so they have to be, so that's, that's, the, the, that's one of the things about the increase in size. I mean, I can show you what, uh, later on I'll show you why the, why the ribosome is increasing in size, I, at least in the, up to LUCA. I can show you that, I think I know, I think I know. Okay, so there were so many of these things that we didn't know what to do with them, so we grouped them. We, we simplified it, we just grouped them in sort of a, uh, what seemed to us a reasonable way. So instead of having 56 growth events in the large subunit, we have uh, six phases. And we, that's just we've grouped them. And so, so just to be clear of what we have here, we know where growth events occurred. And we know their order in many cases, like this, because of the dependence. And then we have some other information, like let me just give you an example. OK, everybody has to close their eyes for a minute. OK, are your eyes closed? OK, now, let's say I did this. You can open your eyes. Now, let's say I did this with only one hand. And I, and I put the, my coffee there and that, um, my laser pointer. Which one did I put first? Coffee first. And then right, how do you know that? Stability. Yeah, it, we call it dependency. Right, the, the, this laser pointer is dependent on the coffee cup and the coffee cup is not dependent on the laser pointer, okay? So, and we use this all the time in our daily lives when we look at things. Like if you see a fence leaning on a wall, you know, or if you see a rake leaning on a fence, you know the fence was there before the rake because, the, because of this dependence thing. Okay, turns out RNA structure has these sort of things built in. They're called, um, one of them, uh, one class of them, are called A minor interactions, where you have something just like this. You have a helix, and then you have another stem coming in and grabbing it. And um, uh, Sergi Steinberg worked out that, that the helix is older than, the, than this um, sort of donor part of the A minor interaction, right? So we have these sort of dependencies built into the ribosome that are part of our model also. So, yes? How many different types of fingerprints that indicate growth Um. Uh, we have this paper where we list them all. There's, they're basically all, uh, the vast majority of them are the ones that I, I showed. Um, I think um, there are some cases where, uh, where helix elongate and we can um, see the effect of that elongation on other RNA, I think. So, but, but essentially, the vast majority of our, of our um, of our the the growth events we infer are these um, ancestor are these fingerprints and especially here I'm not sure if I had it on a slide but in the oldest part of the RNA we have a lot of really beautiful I mean it's just it's so detailed what we can see in the in the deepest deepest oldest part of the RNA it was very clean uh, growth process there okay so this means we have a model of how the RNA how the ribosome originated the common part the part before LUCA right we can look back before the last universal common ancestor, and we can see how the ribosome grew. And this is, uh, this is based on structure, right? I haven't really talked about sequence. It's ba and it's, it's molecular, and it is to the, it is to the, it's atomic level, right? We know the positions of the atoms and how the atoms changed over time. So it's a very, very detailed atomic level model of ribosomal evolution. Um, and this is what I haven't explained to you. It actually shows us the origins of RNAs, of the origins of, pro and I don't mean of RNAs, I mean of RNA. I want to get this R, the small r out. It really shows us the origins of RNA, and it really shows us the origin of protein. That's what I'm going to show you next. And this is experimentally testable, because these are all atomic level models, and we make them, and we test their predictions. We look at their folding and their function in the lab. That's one of the things we do uh, in my lab. We, we make all of these. It's fine to draw pictures on the screen, but you've got to actually make the molecules. Okay, another thing I want to say about this, how am I, where am I time-wise? Okay, that's good, okay. Is that 
uh, one of the interesting things about RNA in general and the ribosome in particular is that function is kind of uh, separated in space in the ribosome. So if we know sort of the order of addition of these various structural units, we actually know the order of addition of function. Okay, we can say what happened when. And so one of the things really important is the interface. The interface happened after the green part. Okay, so this tells us right away that the two subunits had independent lives before they ever met up. Okay, there was, a, there was an ancestor of a large subunit and an ancestor of a small subunit, and they were doing something before the interface. Okay? Um, that's just one of the, and there's a lot of different sort of functional things we can say about the order of what happened in the ribosome. Okay, now I want to talk about the tunnel. The tunnel is, this is not something we anticipated or built into our model at all, but it's something we noticed right away. Okay, so I'm going to walk through the evolution of the ribosome according to the phases. This is a large subunit we're looking at. And we're just going to walk through dark blue. We're going to add each phase as it was added. And we are looking right down the tunnel. But the tunnel doesn't exist yet, right? Because this, this is the oldest piece of RNA. This is your mother, right? This is the, that dark blue thing. That is, we believe, the oldest piece of RNA in the known universe, okay? That is, that is where the ribosome comes from. That is, there is no piece of RNA we know of that, that rivals this thing in age. And then this gets added on. So right away, we get, it's not a tunnel, it's just a pore, okay? But one of the first things that happens is the pore. Then it gets longer. Then it gets longer and it gets rigidified. Actually, uh, in fact, this, this green, you can't really see this here. This green thing right here, this wraps all around. This is a donut around the tunnel, okay? So this, this green phase right here this green phase is essentially building the tunnel. That is, what, that's, that is what that's about. And then the yellow, you can see the tunnel gets bigger. And then the orange adds to the tunnel. And then the red adds to the tunnel, right? So every single phase of ribosomal evolution is building the tunnel. And uh, so we think about this kind of like Huckleberry Finn. You know, there's all these stories, but really the Mississippi River. People still read Huckleberry Finn? I read it when I was young. Okay. The, the, the Mississippi River is the theme. All the stories are kind of wrapped around that. That's the way you should think about the evolution of the ribosome, okay? The ribosome is all about the tunnel, building the tunnel. There was a lot of other things that happened, but they happened like at one point and then nothing. You know, like you build an interface, then you're done. Or you do this, then you're done. But the tunnel, every single phase of ribosomal evolution builds a tunnel. And why is that? What does that mean? Building the tunnel. You can see it's a really long tunnel. This tells you really, I think, that the ribosome is all about protein. And that since this is a protein, especially in the early ribosome, think about it. Before there was a small subunit, the ribosome was synthesizing something. And uh, it basically, this is before the small subunit right here. So the tunnel was there. Okay, we don't have a small subunit yet. We're not making coding. There can't be any coding, right? We're making something and it's going through a tunnel. Okay? And before that, the tunnel was shorter. So somehow give a longer tunnel conferred advantage, right? Maybe it allowed the ribosome to make longer products. And some of those products bound back and stuck to it and made it better, right? So we think that, that basically the ribosome synthesized a bunch of stuff, probably a bunch of useless stuff. A small fraction of it bound back, conferred advantage. And the bigger those things got, the bigger the ribosome could get, right? So big tunnel, bigger products, and you just went around and around in a circle. So the, I'm sorry, but it wasn't necessarily synthesizing proteins. I didn't say proteins. Yeah, exactly. I don't believe it was proteins. No, it's not. In fact, Alex Rich, you're at MIT. You guys heard of Alex Rich? No. Really? Are you all geologists? Okay. <laughs> okay. Alex Rich, who discovered the tunnel, also showed that the ribosome can make polyester. Right, the ribosome doesn't have, if you, if you put the wrong thing on tRNAs, ribosome doesn't have to make polypeptide. Ribosome can make a lot of different, can do a lot of chemistry, okay? So we think at this point, the, the ribosome was probably making polyester or thioester or things like this, right? There's no reason why it, in fact, if you look at abiotic chemistry, if you look at the Murchison meteorite, 
For example, there's a lot of oxy acids, more, there's more oxy acids than amino acids in the Murchison meteorite. So I can't think of any reason why the ribosome was not making polyester at this point. And some of those polyesters were binding back onto the ribosome and conferring advantage. And you know, it didn't have to be very good. It only had to be better than the competition. And probably the competition, if you're the first, the competition wasn't very good. So the ribosome was a terrible enzyme. It was doing, it was doing a really bad job, but it was just good enough. Okay, so now, this is kind of the, uh, uh, an amazing thing we can see. If we look in the ribosome, we know the dates of all the RNA, the relative ages of all the RNA in the, in the ribosome. The ribosome has a lot of proteins too. I haven't talked about those yet, but the large subunit has 30 proteins, okay? And we look at those proteins and we can date them, and we do that by the RNA that's around it, right? So this polypeptide has old RNA, this polypeptide has less old, and this part, Polypeptide has less old. So I've color coded it. Actually, I've color coded it exactly the same way here. Okay? We don't have a way of dating the protein the way we date the RNA. We date it really by the RNA that's around it. Okay? That's how we date the protein. And so when, when the protein passes between a, between a phase in three dimensions, we slice it. Okay? That's what these slices are. Okay? So we, this, is, this part is in the green phase. This part is in the yellow phase. This part is in the orange phase. Okay, so we can date the proteins. And look what we see. This is a, we, there's a lot of protein, so we don't just, this isn't just anecdotal. The oldest part of the protein is not folded correctly, okay? It looks like what we call frozen random coil. In fact, we believe this protein, this is before protein learned to fold. In fact, it was maybe not even protein, right? It was ester and things that were not, by, by, didn't, hadn't learned to fold. I mean, it wasn't chemically the right thing. This was ester. You can't make a beta sheet out of ester, right? So we think we're looking very far back in biology here. We're looking at, um, at protein before it was protein, right? This is a fossil now. It's, now it's polypeptide. But we think we're looking at the molecular record of what it was before that. And then, then we see this thing here. So look at this. This is, this is what we call a beta-beta structure, right? Two beta strands. And in general, in biology, you do not see isolated beta strands. You see a lot of beta strands in various proteins, but you don't see isolated with no protein around. And look at, this is what we see in the protein. These are all isolated beta-beta structures. And by isolated, I mean they're wrapped in RNA, right? These are not isolated from everything. They're isolated from other proteins. Okay, so these are all structure proteins that have starting to learn how to fold and they are doing this in a sea of RNA. Okay? So we believe that the RNA is essentially teaching the protein to fold. And these are molecules obviously you don't teach them, but basically the RNA is selecting for molecules that can fold into these structures and that can and they stick to the ribosome and confer advantage. That's what I really mean by that. And so this can be ester, but not fully, because this has to be a proton donor, so this cannot be an ester. This can be an ester. So this can be a mixture of ester. See, this part here can be 100% ester. This can be maybe 50% ester. This has to be 0% ester, right? So we're seeing a chemical evolution of polypeptide in the, in the ribosome. And so this is mapped, all of the sort of statistical data we see, mapped out of the phases of the ribosome. So the oldest part of the ribosome is this blue part. We don't see any protein there. We think this is older than protein. Okay, so RNA seemed to have led protein in biology. Then we see this frozen random coil. Then we see these collapsed, what we call beta-beta structures. Then we see beta domain proteins. Then we see these more complicated folds. And then the next phase, which I don't have here, which is the protist phase, the proteins have reached out and started to touch each other. Okay, so we can see that this, this looks like what's called a protein folding funnel. Right? But it's not. It's really just proteins taken out of the ribosome. But this is a history of protein folding, which is mapped into the ribosome. Yes? So do you think that uh, the amino acids that made these proteins as you evolve the ribosome were all 20 amino acids were there at the beginning? Because in order to get alpha helices, you need hydrophobics. And if you look at uh, sort of how you make amino acids today from the citric acid cycle, hydrophobics are hard, whereas making glycine or proline, uh, and those are the ones that would fold without complicated folds. 
Yeah. So it really is a measure of the amino acids that are available to the proteins that they're making. Exactly. I mean, that's what we published. So right. I just, I'm, you know. I've read your papers, so yes. Um, <laughs> I write great papers. This is High Hartman, you guys. Um, so uh, <laughs> now I've totally lost my train of thought. Right, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't really know, from our data, we don't know specifically what the proteins, what the amino acid sequences are, but I think it's safe to say that there had to be cationic amino acids here, right? This is not going to stick to the ribosome. But let me tell you guys, we are doing this experiment in the lab. We can make abiotic peptides. Uh, my collaborator, Nick Hutt, has figured out how to use dry down cycles, take prebiotic components and make peptides, and we can select for things that bind to RNA. We can actually recapitulate this in the lab, and that is something we're doing right now. And um, you know, we have to make guesses. In fact, we believe, like for example, now we have lysine and arginine; those are the two cationic amino acids. But as High outlined in his paper, uh, previously the, the sort of uh, abiotic uh, ancestors of those were probably shorter, um, uh, shorter cationic amino acids. And so we're using those sorts of things in our experiments. Okay, so this is the. Uh, Origin. OK, so let me just put everything on the same scale here. This is the evolution of the ribosome that we can see. Assume, and you know, our two assumptions are that the ribosome grew by accretion early on, just like it did late, and that these assert, insertion fingerprints mean the same thing now that they meant previously. So that's our assumption. But basing that assumption, assuming that assumption, we really have a very detailed uh, molecular model of the ribosome. And along with that, we have a molecular model of protein folding that comes out of this. So, um, and, uh, so, and, and, so, and we also have, uh, I haven't really shown it here, but we can say like when does the GTPA center get and all of that sort of stuff. So basically what I would say to you is if you wanted to talk about the origin of life, where you go from chemistry to biology, I would put it here, okay? This Right here, you really don't need, I mean, you need some kind of coding, but it doesn't have to be much. I mean, I, exactly what, you know, this, this was probably not fully protein, right? And this, there's no energy transduction here. This is not a motor. This is a Brownian uh, diffusive machine. And uh, this is a totally different beast, all right? Here we are transducing energy. The, the GTP center is here. To make this, this requires coding, right? You have to code your protein in order to make molecules like this. This thing is capable of being a sophisticated enzyme. This is not, okay? So even though these kind of look the same, everything changes here. It requires genes. You need genes to make this, right? You don't need genes to make that. I mean, you need some short thing, right? So this is, this is the transcendental state of the ribosome where you have to go from chemistry to biology. You cannot go through, you cannot get from here to here without transcription and replication and all those other things that I'm not even showing. We don't know what's going on there. But here you could say I have some chemical evolutionary process that can maybe get me here. Not here, right? This is, this, this is where we go from chemical evolution to Darwinian evolution at this point. Um, so, uh, okay, I think I can wind up here. I have a, let me, this is not. I think I'll leave that. OK, yeah, let me just conclude with this one. OK, so now let's go back to the tree of life. So this is the, the sort of state of the art tree of life. And this is Luca. So Luca is our last universal common ancestor. And usually people stop here when they draw the tree of life. They stop at Luca. But I really don't think that's necessary. We can go back. We can see beyond. So in fact, these are the phases of ribosomal evolution. And uh, we have extremely detailed information on what happened before Luca. So we can look back to the root of the tree and, and we can see what's going on there. And I want to I just conclude with sort of a little bit of a philosophical um, kind of statement. If you look at biology, this is something that studying the ribosome, I mean, maybe I've just gotten weird from studying the ribosome. I dream about it every night. So I will confess that. But, if you think about it, I showed you that RNA taught protein to fold, right? That's what we see in the ribosome. We can see protein learning to fold, but it's doing it in a sea of RNA. Everything that's happening there is surrounded by RNA. I didn't really show you this. I should have. But the RNA is changing at the same time, okay? So the old part of the RNA is not really forming base pairs. It's in these strange um, sort of non-canonical states. And as the RNA gets, as it, as it progresses, as the protein learns to fold, the RNA learns to fold also. 
Okay? So these molecules are teaching each other what to do and what to fold. And so we call this a mutualism relationship. And this, is, this, this kind of logic is seen everywhere in biology, where you have systems that take care of each other. Right? You have microbes in your gut that take care of you, and you take care of them. And in fact, plants make you oxygen. Right? So this, this, I mean, it's all for some kind of self-advantage. But still, biology is, is just this network of mutualisms. And we believe that, that you have to, dis when you think of a cell, you should think of molecules in mutualism. Right? All RNA is made by protein. Right? All of it. All protein is made by RNA. Right? So these are molecules that are taking care of each other. There's making care in, in modern biology that you can certainly describe them as a mutualism relationship. And one of the things about mutualism relationships is the systems co-evolve. Right? They don't like when you look, think about a lichen. You know, you have a you have a fungus and you have uh, an algae, and neither of them uh, can live without the other. Right? They become codependent. In fact, I guess that's why I. Yeah. OK, think about the mitochondrion, for example. Your mitochondrion is a, is a cell living inside of your cells, which is in a symbiotic relationship with its host, which was some previous cell, right? And uh, your mitochondrion takes care of the host, and the host takes care of the mitochondrion, right? And the, the mitochondrion has evolved intensely since that original endosymbiotic event. So you could not pretend to understand the, the mitochondrion except in the context of its host. And you can't understand the nucleus except in the context of the mitochondrion, right? It doesn't make sense to think about these things independently. And that's how we think about macromolecules, right? If you want to think about protein, you cannot think about, you cannot understand its evolution except in context of RNA and vice versa. This is why these molecules are sort of the antithesis. This thing assembles with its backbone. This one assembles with its side chain. This is neutral. This is these, things, these molecules are in a yin-yang relationship, right? Because, and it's not an accident, it's because they created each other and they needed, they needed complementary competencies. So the reason why RNA and protein are so different is because that's the only thing, or that's the thing that would succeed best. Okay, thank you guys. Oh, I need to talk about some people. Anton Petrov is uh, um, a research scientist in my lab. And uh, he's been with me a long time. And he sort of runs my whole bioinformatics program. Uh, he has the uh, ribosome um, of almost every organism in three dimensions memorized in his brain. And uh, in fact, he was visiting Thank You Ramakrishnan's lab a while ago. And they had a ribosome structure. And he said, he said oh my god, the peptidyl transferase has changed. Something, this ribosome is different from all other ribosomes. And they looked, and there was a problem with their refinement. They had misconnected two nucleotides in their refinements. That's how detailed Anton's understanding of the ribosome is. And uh, um, uh, this is uh, Chad who, and, and um, Nicholas, who are also uh, helping me with my bioinformatics part. And then Jessica Bowman is my lab manager, who sort of does uh, all kinds of, I mean, she does a lot of great experiments and has made a lot of the RNAs I'm talking about. And I also need to thank. NASA, I should have a big NASA logo and a little NSF logo here to scale them to their contributions, but whatever. I need to thank them for supporting my lab. And thank you guys for your attention. <laughs> it's hot in here. You did well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. That was great. Um, so we have uh, 15 minutes for general questions from the audience. And then after that, I would ask the students that are enrolled in the course to stick around for uh, a roundtable session with Mark. Yes. That's a good question. Uh, I'm assuming the double stranded RNA uh, in the context of the ribosome is the same as the one that you have in the cell. Yeah. Uh, but there's a difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I'll repeat the question. She said she assumes that the RNA in the ribosome is protected by proteins, and, but these long tentacles seem to be naked and would seem to be very vulnerable to all kinds of bad things happening to them. Like micro -RNAs. microRNAs. yes, exactly. We tried to cut them off with microRNAs, actually. So um, 
one thing is that the ribosome itself is not, you, you can't really describe the RNA as being protected by protein. You know, uh, one of the ways to think about our ribosomal RNA is, I mean, it's a special cast of RNA. It's, it's been around forever, and it's very selected. So if you take ribosomal RNA and you just leave it sitting out on the bench and you compare it to like an mRNA, an mRNA will degrade and, you know, ribosomal RNA is just so tough. Right? It's just uh, because it's assembled and it's, I guess it's been selected, things that degraded went away, right? So ribosomal RNA is, it's like tRNA is the same way, right? It just doesn't degrade very quickly. Now these tentacles in these structures, they seem to be naked, but we assume in real biological systems they're not. Yeah, but, but we don't think they're like protected by, I never thought about like protected, but we think they're docking sites for proteins, that, that proteins that are ancillary to ribosomal function that might change over time and, and various, you know, state of development or tissue dock onto these sites. Actually, you know, one really interesting thing I can tell you is that they are very GC rich. They are, and so they're really stable. And we have, uh, we think we have detected G quadruplexes in, in the human ribosome. And actually we can see those sequences in other ones. So you say, why would there be quadruplexes in these things? I mean, I, that must be for protein binding, I would think. So I don't think they're just naked in real biology. You know, one of the things to think about in the ribosome, about a quarter, maybe more, of the cell mass of any cell is ribosome, OK? So to a first approximation, you are just a bag of ribosomes. I mean, that's what we are. And um, what it means is that things that bind, even with low affinity to the ribosome, will bind to it, right? Because the concentrations are so high. I mean, it's, it's impossible to be in a cell and not run into ribosomes. So when you, normally when we think about things binding in biology, you know, you think about nanomolar or something. If you have millimolar affinity for a ribosome, in a cell you will be binding to a ribosome because that's how things are just so concentrated. Everything in a cell at some level sticks to ribosomes. There are just so many of them there. So I don't believe they're... You know, when you purify these things and you do cryo-EM, maybe those proteins get stripped away. But I think, you know, yeah, they, they're probably not just sitting out there. Yes? Uh, two quick questions. One quick, maybe the other is a little longer. Uh, I'm interested to know how you know that the uh, small subunit is not as old as the large subunit. Oh, yeah. And I would also like to know if you think that dark blue section synthesized it and looked at it chemically in the lab. Okay, I'll answer the last question first. Yes, we have made a whole bunch of those. Uh, in fact, we've done all those expansion sections. We have all those pieces of RNA in the lab. Talk about the oldest yeah, the oldest piece, and then the next oldest, and we've made them all. Yes, and yes, we are doing that right now. In fact, we're doing these dry down experiments where we're making peptides abiotically, and we're putting those pieces of RNA in there, and we're seeing if that will redirect the products or change the products of the. You also well, uh, enzymatic activity is sort of in the eye of the beholder at this point. We, like, so for example, we're saying if we can dry down, if we, if we make peptides abiotically by drying things down, we can do that easily. We can make 20 mers. And uh, then we add this RNA, and does it change? Does it make them longer? Does it, um, does it change? Is it self-catalytic would be the question I would ask, or auto <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't believe so. We haven't seen, yeah, I don't believe it's autocatalyst. Yeah, okay, first question. Okay, now what was the second question? First question, first question. what was the first question? The first question was, how do you know that the uh, large subunit? Oh, yes, okay, so I didn't really show this, but we have a lot of information on the evolution of the interface and on what happened when in the interface and on what the stages of the two ribosomes were when the interface formed. And so we do have, well, um, Number one, we know, when the, we know when the interface happened, and then we have, these, we have these dependencies in the interface, the same ones I talked about you, where we have the, so we can say the large. How do you know when it happened? Oh, how do we know when it happened? Okay, we know what the interfacial RNA is, mm -hmm. right? We know, because we know what the ribosome is. We have our insertion fingerprints, and we have the temporal uh, evolution, so we know that phase four is when the ribosome, and so we know what happened to the large sub. And the, the small ribosome isn't older, it wasn't floating around. Yeah, around okay. I should, I should say that a different way. I should say that the, the small subunit was less developed and was smaller. It could have been older. Yes, absolutely could have been older. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Right. Um, right. Yeah, no, thank you. Right. It could have been way older. We have no idea. Okay. Right. Good.
I mean, there's a number of reasons why the large came before the small. The first one was you have a self uh, uh, folding RNA that forms the site, the PTC site. You have nothing like that in the small. I, I beg to differ, hi. I think we do have a self fold. Yes, we do. We think Is that we do. The one that you published with Petrov? Uh, I don't know if we published this one yet. I don't think so. Is it of a small RNA? The, the active site of the small RNA does not have a self-folding RNA. Okay. In the same is... sense that the PTC. When you show the PTC, that beautiful structure that is invariant from the yeah. T0, there's nothing like that in the small site. Okay. okay. Well, let me let me uh, let me summarize. Hi, this is my talk. Okay, I'll talk to you. Later. <laughs> we are. He calls me once a week. Um, okay, so guys, with the large subunit, it really, it grew, you can kind of think about it, mushrooms growing out of mushrooms. That's kind of how, especially the early evolution of the life. With the small subunit, we think there was a little bit of that, but then something happened, which is you form a pseudonaut. The very core of the small subunit is a pseudonaut, and in order to form a pseudonaut, you have to strip a piece of RNA, you have to melt a helix and bring that other strand to make the pseudonaut. So we think the single-stranded binding functionality was built very early into the small subunit. Okay? So we can see that there was some fundamental difference. We don't really know. I mean, ancestrally, we think we kind of know what the large subunit did. We don't know what the small subunit did, except that it had a single strand sitting out there to bind to something, which is now the Scheindel-Garnel sequence, anti-Scheindel-Garnel sequence. Okay? But that, that was built in very early. And we can see that because the pseudonaut requires that you peel away a strand and expose a single strand. And then the small subunit grew by this uh, sort of um, what we call a dendrite thing, where this, the large subunit is just monolith. And if you think about building a tunnel, I mean, think about driving on a tunnel through the Cascade Mountains or whatever. You know, if, the, if things move, the tunnel is going to break, right? So the large subunit is just this rigid, nothing moves in the large subunit. Okay, the small subunit doesn't have a tunnel, and it is a dendrite with all, the, there's a lot of motions going on in the small subunit. So these the two subunits have different functions, they have different histories, and they have totally different structures. If we have a, Anton has a talk, he says, uh, the large subunit is from Venus and the small subunit is from Mars or something like that. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I can't remember. Okay, I got that backwards. <laughs> yes. So maybe my question is vague, so you don't have to answer it. But from ribosomes that just produce things without transduction to ribosomes that actually decode and yeah. perform the transduction, how do you kind of conceive that? Um, is it like a gradual thing or is it like something yeah. special? Uh, okay. So one thing, we think everything was gradual and incremental and conferred advantage at every step. Okay, that's sort of our nothing. In fact, we think everything, if you were there watching, you could predict the next step maybe, right? That nothing, uh, if we really knew the conditions, it would, all, it would be like watching rust grow on an iron, right? You know, if you, it's just that everything happened, nothing. In fact, a lot of times when people are talking about the origin of life, they want to talk about sort of esoteric or exotic kinds of things. We just think this was all just basic, simple chemistry happening on a grand scale. And that, um, OK, so um, so yeah, so OK, I'm not sure I fully understand, under, uh, sort of answered your question. So for coding, uh, what, what we think is that, number one, coding was gradual. And initially, there was a mini helix, Paul Schimmel's mini helix. And whenever you have a mini helix, you have a, a, some kind of unpaired nucleotides at the end. I mean, that's sort of a necessity of a stem loop. And a GNRA tetraloop, which are very common, have three unpaired nucleotides. Looks just like an anticodon. And we think that, the, uh, that initially the origins of coding was a piece of RNA that stuck as a cofactor and positioned things in order to get better chemistry. So, so that is the ultimate origins of coding, that you had a stem loop and, uh, and, and then, and, th and there was one precipitous event, which was the doubling of tRNA. In fact, because we do know that tRNA was a stem loop, and it just, boom, it doubled. It inserted and doubled. So initially, you have the, you have the amino acid acceptor step. Then all of a sudden, you get the anticodon 70 angstroms away. And that doubling, we believe, drove the association of the subunits. 
right? Before that doubling event, there was no reason for the large subunit and the small subunit to talk to each other. So actually, the, the uh, precipitous event was the doubling of tRNA, which drove the development of the, um, of the two subunits, okay? So that, we think, was maybe a precipitous event, the doubling, everything, tRNA is what really drove that. If you didn't have the anticodon 70 angstroms away from the amino acid, there, you know, that's, for an enzyme, this is a crazy amount of distance, right? And, um, and that, that was a, a, a kind of an amazing event during the evolution of the ribosome. And there's no reason for the, the subunits to ever come together before that happens. Does that, does that sort of answer your question? But we don't think anything was precipitous, except a, a doubling event is by nature sort of precipitous. But yes? I'm one of those geologists in the audience where a lot of the terminology goes over okay, my I'm head. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To the science. I appreciate the sort of layman's way you presented it, but <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that concerns me a little bit, you keep using terms like learning and teaching mm -hmm. molecules and the right. sort of intelligence yes. embedded in the terminology you're using, probably for layman to understand yeah. better. But I'm assuming these are all happy accidents that survived and gave advantages, as opposed to unhappy accidents which caused extinction. Yeah. I, I don't, cool ones that just went away. I don't know if I call them accidents. I guess I would say so. This is sort of the way to think about it. Is there? We think there was enormous numbers of ribosomes that were different, involving all different kinds of polymers and everything. And we're only looking at the winner. Right? So it's not necessarily an accident. It's sort of a, a result of a statistical process. That, and, and you're right. You shouldn't say learning and teaching. You know, um, they're molecules. Yeah, teleology and biology. Yeah. Well yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, RNA did not teach protein to fold. RNA selected for protein that folded. Yeah, is, is actually the correct way to ta teach it. Even in the discussion of the tunnel that you talked about, the tunnel is obviously an early, early form, yeah. and it had some function we don't fully understand. Yes. Obviously, the next happy accident is going to block the tunnel and make it useless, so it had to grow somewhere. Right. We, we think the original the function of the tunnel was to keep the ends. The problem with making peptides abiotically is the ends come around and cycleize and kill the polymerization. So the tunnel bigger on purpose. No, no. It didn't block the tunnel so it couldn't work. Right. And the idea made it bigger, it had a happy accident. It could do something new that was advantageous. Yeah. I guess the reason I don't like the word accident is that it makes it seem like kind of an unusual event. What we think is there was a, there was a statistical process of all kinds of things going on. Everything was tried. Even now in biology, when we think about the expansions of the ribosome, we say, oh, this expanded. Actually, everything's happening, but we're only looking at the survivors, right? Mm -hmm. So that's... That's kind of the way to think about it. Um, yeah. Uh, the, uh, we think the original function of the tunnel, when it was a pore, was to keep the ends apart. Because when you make a dipeptide, it just cyclizes and that's it. You're done. And, uh, and that's very stable and happens really readily. And so the, it looks like that really the, the initial function of the ribosome is to allow you to go beyond that and make a trimer. That, that we think, the original peptidyl transferase center, that was really what it was about. And some fraction of those stuck to it and allowed it to survive and then sort of bootstrap this tunnel thing. So, Warren, mm. I have one last comment to make. Obviously, uh, you are dreaming about ribosomes. <laughs> and, and that is a beautiful, I, your talk was spectacular. The only problem is, that the code comes in with the uh, synthetases, and the evolution of the tRNA is coupled to the evolution of the synthetase. There's things called the operational code in the arm, and the question really then is, and there's the anti-codon interaction. So the question that I think you should think a little more carefully about is, how does this correlate what happened in the synthetases with what's happening on the ribosome? I, I agree totally. And actually, and, 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 and uh, the stuff we're finding on the evolution of the synthetases. Anyway, that's all, all I'm trying to say to you is the ribosome is part a mutual system with the, synth with the synthetases. And you, I think, you should think a little more carefully about okay. that. I, I agree. One thing, let me say this. The oldest, this, this is a ribosomal protein. This is what we think is the oldest ribosome. And you see, this looks a lot like a synthetase, right? The conserved oldest synthetases are the same fold. 
right? So the evolution of synthetases cannot be extracted from the evolution of ribosomal proteins. There are a couple. Of them. Yeah. Okay. Question is which came first. All right. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. Okay. Any uh, time for one last question? Okay. Well, let's thank Lori again. Thank you guys for coming on the same